Okay, well, welcome everybody, and thanks for joining today. Um, I think we have a really, really exciting and information-packed uh, session about to start. And I really want to thank all our speakers, um, Rich Horlack, Troy Carter, Chris Holland, Brian Worth, and Dave Humphreys, who are joining us today. And of course, um, you all probably know that you know, NURSE started as a, a fusion energy research center at Livermore back in 1974. And ever since we've had, of course, a huge, um, a huge community of fusion and plasma physics researchers using NERSC, and you know, they're, they're one of our very, very important communities. And um, they've recently done a lot of work to kind of plot their, their course for over the next coming years. And so I invited this group to give us some summaries of some of these reports. And um, you know, we really want to understand the fusion community and what they need to do and where they're going. And, so we can we can better support them. So, with that, why, why don't we go ahead and get started? I think uh, Rich will go first. No, I think it makes more sense for Troy and for Chris to go first, since they're giving the big picture, and then we can talk about the pilot plan. If that's okay with Troy, that's, that's fine with me. Yeah, I'll share my screen here. Okay, hopefully that's visible. Thanks uh, for the invitation. So we're going to take a do a short presentation here, and Chris Holland um, from UCSD will help me as the uh, subject matter expert for high performance computing as part of the subcommittee. Um, I want to tell you about the the report of the FISAC um, uh, called "Powering the Future of Fusion and Plasmas." I'll point out first of all, this is not just uh, this report not just focused on fusion. Of course, DOE FES. Uh, has a, a broad portfolio, so we'll also talk about uh, plasma science and technology applications, uh, and Chris will talk a little bit about computing needs there. Um, so just to give you a quick overview of this report, first of all, bottom right, right corner, you can download a, a, a PDF of the report or see a web version at usfusionandplasmas.org. There we go. Um, so this process started in 2018 with a charge from Steve Binkley from the Office of Science. Um, to PSAC, and the charge asked uh, for a strategic planning process that covers the entire portfolio, so uh, fu fusion energy uh, development as well as the stewardship of, of broader plasma science. Importantly, this is a two-part process. It's modeled after the, the high energy physics P5 uh, process, where they had a, a snow mass part that was a community-driven piece, and then a piece led by P5 itself, which is a subcommittee of, of HEPAP. So the equivalent for us, we had a community-led process that went for a year um, that was led by the APS Division of Plasma Physics in collaboration with other uh, community organizations. A um, series of workshops and process that led to, to enumeration of opportunities, but also uh, the community did the hard work together of, of prioritizing and providing guidance to the PSAC-led uh, subcommittee on prioritizing these activities. And that was followed by the PSAC phase, which, which I led and Chris was part of. Um, we had a budgetary uh, task, which was to uh, produce uh, over 10 years, fiscal 22 to 31, uh, optimized program for FES. And so with, with three budget scenarios, constant level of effort, which is just uh, in, uh, accounting for inflation, modest growth, uh, and then unconstrained but prioritized. Um, as part of this, the EATER project is a big part of um, FES, uh, a big construction project. We were told in the charge to assume that U.S. contributions to the EATER construction project will continue. We took that to mean that our job was not to uh, project that, and we focused on instead the non-EATER project portion uh, of the uh, DOE FES budget. Uh, just to give the context, so again, um, you, you're going to hear from Rich in a second and Brian about the report on your right, but this uh, process happened uh, along with a lot of other activity by the National Academies. There's really four reports that have bearing and provide context for, for this FESAC report. Um, two of them, uh, well, really one of them exclusively focused on, on the plasma science area, and that's the first one on the left. Um, plasma science decadal covered that too, as well as fusion. Uh, but then the burning plasma report and uh, the bringing fusion to the U.S. grid were focused on the fusion part. And these reports set the stage by conveying exciting opportunities in both plasma science and technology, and also the urgent need to accelerate development of fusion energy that was really started with the 2019 burning plasma report and amplified tremendously by the uh, report that Rich led. Uh, and that those reports laid out the goal of a fusion pilot plan, an electricity producing pilot plan on a time scale sufficient to mitigate climate change to impact uh, decarbonization by mid-century. 
Uh, all right, so let me just give you the high level executive summary um, messages from the PSAC report. Uh, and I'll go, I'll talk, I won't take you through all the recommendations. I'll just give you a few highlights and I'll let Chris talk specifically about uh, how high performance computing uh, is, what, 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 what do we need from NERSC <laughs> to get this to happen? Um, all right, so the first message on the fusion side is that really now is the time uh, to move aggressively towards development and deployment of fusion energy. And why is now the time? Um, there's really a few things that point that way. Um, first and foremost, scientific advancements over the last decade, technological innovations. Um, I, I have a couple of, of graphs here and figures here that motivate that. So reaching, reaching record uh, confined magnetic pressure on Aquator CMOD is one example of scientific advancement, uh, really understanding uh, how to uh, uh, understanding the, the edge of the plasma, the pedestal to help boost performance and, and get much uh, higher pressure in the core. Uh, technologically, uh, it's, it's really high temperature superconductors that have been a game changer here. Uh, and after this report, of course, recently there was an announcement from uh, Commonwealth Fusion Systems on successfully uh, producing a, a prototype 20 Tesla coil using high temperature superconductor. And that really opens up uh, uh, new directions, important um, opportunities in fusion. Uh, so these things point, point the way to this goal of a fusion pilot plant that was laid out by the um, 2019 burning plasma report. Another driver here is the growth of the fusion energy industry. So one of the goals, of course, is to commercialize fusion. And so the growing that industry is important. And that industry has been seeded by significant investment in startup uh, fusion ventures. So around $2 billion at the time of the writing of the report has been invested in a, a large number of companies. You can see the logos here. Uh, on the other side of the, the portfolio, so plasma science and technology um, says here has far reaching impact. Uh, and the message is plasmas have and will continue to transform society. Uh, and that impact spans across, of course, fusion energy. You, know, you have to have a plasma uh, at the core of your fusion reactor. So really understanding plasma physics is important. Uh, everything you look up in the night sky and it's glowing is a plasma. So understanding processes in the universe, um, plasma physics is, is essential. Uh, and then exotic states of matter we can create in the laboratory using the world's most intense lasers. Understanding that requires a deep knowledge of plasma physics. And importantly, something we call out in this report um, is that there are transformative applications uh, of plasmas um, and, and technology that impact our everyday lives. So the one that we sh may all be familiar with is you know, every electronic component, every uh, uh, integrated chip that's in your phone or your computer uh, is produced using plasma processing techniques. But beyond that, there are uh, additional things that are called out in our report and were called out in the plasma decadal um, where plasmas can be used in an application to enable a more sustainable society. Plasma enhanced chemistry, for example, uh, plasma purification. Um, another high level message in the report is about partnerships. Um, partnerships accelerate progress and there's a few categories in which we talked about. Um, international partnership, the ITER project is, is a critically important part of the fusion program in the US. Um, public private partnerships this is an area given the opportunities uh, enabled by the investment in the private sector. So there's a lot of companies uh, that have, uh, have grown up um, over the last decade and have, have uh, received lots of investment. Uh, partnering with them is essential for a, a variety of reasons. One, to enable uh, more rapid joint progress, uh, but also one of the goals, again, if we want to commercialize fusion energy, we have to grow the industry. So some focus on investing there um, to accelerate progress is important. Uh, and finally, especially on the plasma science side, but also this is important on the fusion side, there's a um, multitude of agencies that fund, uh, in addition to DOE FES, that fund research into plasma science and fusion energy research. Um, we need better partnerships between those agencies. There are barriers that kind of prevent progress. Uh, and so we call that out as, a, as something that's important to focus on. Uh, all right, another high level message. So the plasma uh, science and fusion energy, you could ar argue really grew up in the US. There's a lot of seminal contributions that help grow the field. So the US has been in, in the lead in the world. Um, but we need to act if we want to maintain that. We are losing it to our colleagues in Europe and Asia. Um, so one thing to point out that we put out in the report is that, again, we're poised to create this uh, fusion industry that could be world leading. We have to take the opportunity to support that. 
uh, another high level message is one of the reasons we've lost leadership um, is really because of the absence, absence of investment in major new facilities to address critical R&D needs. And that recommendation is really focused on experimental hardware, but uh, it's important also to think about the computational resources that we need to execute the, the strategy. Um, and I mentioned this two phase process. Um, so this was very important. Um, the, the first phase, the community did, did an amazing job in coming together and really generating consensus and backing um, the, the, the ideas that were put forward in the CPP report that was trans, uh, transferred into this FESAC report. So it's important to note that really the community is backing this, speaking with one voice. There is consensus we have prioritized, um, which was very difficult. And so this, this is a very important message. Um, in addition to that, again, uh, the plan conveys this vision for research and development um, that will bring si significant benefit to society. All right, so those are the high level takeaways. Um, we recommended reorganizing the FES program in, the, in two broad categories with the following missions. Um, first of all, fusion science and technology and emphasis on the technology will become clear and the next slide about recommendations um, need to increase investment in the technology side too. Um, this should focus on establishing the scientific and technical basis for this fusion pilot plant that I mentioned by the 2040s. Um, and so again, this is with the idea of trying to impact um, climate change and, and be ready for decarbonization by mid-century. Uh, and uh, Rich's group will accelerate that even further. Okay. So the, the plasma science and technology area, um, there's a multitude of opportunities there that span a wide range of, of topics, really advanced fundamental understanding of plasmas. And, and in turn, this is a piece that we emphasize is not really a big part of the FES portfolio now, uh, invest in translating these advances into technologies that benefit society. All right, so I'll give you just two slides on um, uh, recommendations. I'm not gonna go through all of them. Um, so I call out just a few here that you might argue were highest priority. Um, within the FST area, the uh, report again lays out this strategy for getting to the FPP by 2040s. Um, important parts of that, first and foremost, um, is a design effort. So this is really a fusion pilot plant design effort that engages all stakeholders in the community. Um, to help establish the technical basis. What do we need to do to close critical gaps um, to get to the FPP? Uh, and this, again, this is where you guys are important. You guys are important across many things here, but theory and computation is essential to really guiding this as well as engineering design tools. We view this as kind of an organizing effort within the program. So this uh, FPP design effort really helps dictate what's important in other aspects of the program is, and so it's very, uh, is essential. Another high level message. So I, I mentioned uh, emphasis on the technology part of fusion science and technology. Uh, we've had less investment than we need, especially with this goal. If we wanna be ready for the fusion pilot plant, we need to invest much more in uh, R&D and fusion materials and technology. And so going along with that are a couple of facilities. One that's uh, in process, which is uh, impacts at Oak Ridge uh, and that we need a fusion prototypic neutron source. And this is not yet in the pipeline in the sense of the DOE CD process. Uh, in addition to these, there's several other recommendations that are also important. Uh, I won't take you through all of them though. Uh, and the idea is we provide adequate support for existing programs needed to close critical gaps to the FPP, but there are also needed new programs and those are all enumerated in the report. Same slide for um, PST recommendations. Um, again, a, a number of recommendations are in there, but the kind of high level one is, is, is to enable or continue steady support, provide steady support for fundamental plasma science. This is the foundation on which the program rests, including what happens in the FST side. Um, again, this, this also thinking towards this um, uh, angle that we're um, highlighting, which is the opportunity to impact uh, society, uh, sustainable society by plasma technologies. Uh, this work also lays the scientific foundation for these technologies, uh, but we also need to establish a, a program that's translational, that offers opportunities to, to look at translating these into uh, applications. Another high level recommendation of the highest level facility recommendation is the completion of the MEC upgrade, um, which is an, an, an upgrade to the end station at LCLS, the matter in extreme conditions up uh, end station. And as before, there's a number of other recommendations uh, in the report um, with prioritization provided. Okay, 
with that, maybe I'll pass it to Chris and let him go through just a couple slides here, talking more specifically about the role um, that nurse can play in, in this strategy. So Chris, go ahead. Okay, I'll just have you flip the slide. I have, I have two slides. Um, yeah, so I think as Troy alluded to, um, you know, HPC and computing is pretty embedded throughout the uh, entire report. Um, I don't know if it came through, you know, th this uh, process we, that we had for this, we actually had two stages. Um, there was a first what we called the, the CPP, the community planning process, where we got lots of feedback and workshops from everyone across the entire community and put together sort of, you know, a, a version of sort of the, the unconstrained budget, but just identifying all the possibilities of what we could do, what, what, what are the opportunities out there without trying to prioritize with regard to budget or anything. And then this second stage in, in this uh, piece, this Powering the Future report, that's where we brought in some of these uh, budgetary constraints. But there is a separate, a whole separate uh, CPP report as well. And a lot of that has a lot of the technical details that we refer back to. And so if you go through that report, you know, pretty explicitly, and then maybe a bit more implicitly in this FESAC report, what you'll see is that in every one of the recommendations we have, there's opportunities for using uh, high performance computing, computing in general, to advance those um, goals. And so it, you know, it's not that, you know, we don't have a section that's, okay, this is what we do with computing. It's that every section of the report, every set of recommendations all has computing needs. Um, and we tried to call that out as best we can. And in a lot of ways, the, the computation provided one of the real, uh, especially when we couple that with uh, fundamental theory research, that's one of the main ways, that's one of the main linkages between uh, the FS, the, the fusion science technology program and then the plasma science technology. So the fusion science technology, I think as Troy alluded to, I'll talk a little bit more as well, and we'll come up later on, you know, that's going beyond plasmas into all the, the non-plasma, but nuclear technology engineering that you need to build a power plant, whereas the plasma science technology, that's going into all the kinds of plasmas you might study for things beyond fusion. And so, but you know, the plasma is a common link between those and that's sort of obviously what brings us together. Um, you know, at a high level that there's sort of two main, uh, I, I say kind of computation focused uh, or, you know, very computation specific recommendations um, in our FUSAC report that, you know, the first was um, just as a general cross-cutting um, element that we should be a uh, FES needed to really continue supporting both foundational theory and computation um, and you know across the entire program so that we can advance our understanding test new models but you know also start leveraging and utilizing uh, all these uh, new very pretty exciting uh, data science things machine learning artificial intelligence uh, start getting us ready for quantum information science um, th those there are people already in the field looking at, you know, how can we use quantum systems for plasma problems? Um, you know, we also definitely need to take advantage of the investments in exascale computing. And so there, there's a whole, I'll talk in the next slide about some possible opportunities for that, but there's um, across the entire set of recommendations and research, uh, there's some specific, there, you know, there's needs for all of that. Um, and of course we wanna continue the, the close partnership between FES and Oscar on things like SIDAX and certainly something that came up, um, you know, in our discussions, you know, as often as, you know, right now the SIDAX are pretty much focused on fusion, you know, magnetically confined fusion plasmas, but you, there's no reason that it was obvious to us that, you know, they had to stay that way. So whether you, you could expand SIDAX to incorporate uh, other fusion systems, uh, materials, you know, non-fusion studies, you know, the low temperature plasmas for processing, solar physics. There's a whole range of things where that model could be applied, um, take advantage of what's already going on and strengthen it. So, um, you know, at the high level, those are the two in the FESAC report that um, call out computation. If you go look at our CPP report, because we, we had more space, we go into more detail, there's a lot, there's a whole host of additional technical um, recommendations on things to do for computation, both specifically with infusion on um, the integrated modeling tools we need um, for the design effort. And then also just sort of a higher level of um, things like uh, data management, code reproducibility, uh, engineering support, um, taking advantage of things like cloud computing as well. So things that aren't specific to fusion. So just um, kind of two examples of the kinds of stuff we would call out in, the, in our um, report. Um, from the fusion side, you know, as Troy alluded to, one of the, the top level ideas was we need to start up design efforts, design teams uh, 
for identifying possible uh, pilot plant designs. That's what FPP is, fusion pilot plant. Um, so if we want to, in, you know, that we need to, we having validated physics models that are suitable for doing that is going to be absolutely essential to be this on the time scale we want. That if we want our power plants happening on that 20, mid 2030s, 2040 time scale, um, you know, we, we don't have the time or money to go and build many different possibilities. So we need to have models that can really help us identify what's the most efficient path as fast as we can. And what that really means is that we need to couple um, predictive models that are simultaneously quick, efficient, and accurate of a whole lot of different physics phenomena and how those all come together in the pile plant. If so, we're, we're gonna scope these out with urgency. And so certainly that includes the plasma physics models, things that we're doing now, but that goes beyond the models to where the plasma starts interfacing with the materials, the material structures, how they stand up to the neutron environment. Um, Troy mentioned that, you know, the materials uh, experiments we need, but if we want to extrapolate those to a power plant scale facility, we'll absolutely need computation to help do that on a timely fashion. Uh, looking at the techno-economic analysis, it's not just enough that your power plant works, is this going to be economically attractive? Um, so doing all those kinds of computations are vital. And so to develop and validate those models, um, we're going to need both pretty extensive capacity and capability. I don't know if that, those are still the terms, but that's, I think, how we use it. Um, because scope out that range of conditions to build uh, the hierarchy of validated models that we've talked about, you know, we have to run many, many simulations. Um, so you have, and you know, those just by necessity can't always be you know, the heroic, you know, performance pushing ones. So you have to have, you know, be able to do many simulations, many different conditions, call many models many times. But at the same time, you absolutely still need the, the highest fidelity, you know, uh, cutting edge simulations to help inform those models, identify what might be changing as you push into new parameter regimes that will be happening in these reactors. So we need all of that together. So there's a whole range of um, needs there on both the capacity and capability sides um, in fusion that as we pull all of our knowledge together into these integrated models. On the PST side, um, there was a recommendation that for essentially spending what they call the network. So there's an existing network called LaserNet US that uh, the various uh, laser uh, science groups uh, on the US use. They have small facilities around the country that you can go and do research on. You put in proposals. And within our report, we one called for expanding those networks um, to additional new networks for things like low temperature plasmas and magnetized plasmas or pulse power systems. So different kinds of plasma systems that are being studied uh, on campuses and labs. These are smaller scale often than the fusion systems, but also couple in modeling support to them. So this is kind of a common thing we've seen in fusion. I, I imagine many other areas where you may um, do an experiment or something, you get a, you know, someone gets a grant to go do their experimental research, they do that, but then they want to go do some modeling and then you have to go through a whole another process of, okay, well, who's going to do the simulation? Where do I get the computing time for that? And so building in that computing support and the resources, so it's not, you know, the time, but also the expertise into those networks so that you can tie in, uh, they take, you know, different groups can take advantage of the modeling, get the support they need um, to make those more effective. Um, and, you know, just calling out here, like things like the low temperature plasmas, uh, the, there's a plasma technology program, that's no lower recommendation. And there's a whole host there, you know, non-fusion plasma applications in industries now. So there's, you know, a lot of opportunities for, uh, you know, things like this to impact things now pretty immediately. Like, you don't have to just wait for the FPP to come on for, say, you know, improving, whether it's, you know, chip design or manufacturing or, uh, you know, there's everything. We had all kinds of, you know, radiating food and you know solar physics lots of different stuff so and you know, i think because those uh, areas in particular haven't necessarily always had a whole lot of uh, computing support that it, to my mind means that there's a whole lot of potential there for you know even a small investment you know could give them a big leverage in terms of taking advantage of both the data science and the kind of more traditional you know high fidelity you know high performance computing so that's all i wanted to say i don't know i we, I don't know what the plan is if we take questions now or just go through all of it, but happy to answer anything questions people have. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, and I'll just remind you where you can get the report. I think maybe we should move on to hear from Rich and, and others, and then I think the plan is that questions uh, after. Okay. So thanks. Chris. I saw one hand up, but I don't know if we're holding, we can hold till the end. Oh, or... I'm not in charge, so. Okay.
And so I'll hold my question to the end. Thanks. Let me get to my talk. Can you uh, see it? Yeah, we see it, Rich. Okay. Now it's full screen. Yes. Great. I want to thank the, thank you for this opportunity to talk about this National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine report on bringing fusion to the U.S. grid. Uh, this report is the work product of a committee that worked extremely hard uh, and to meet the requirements from DOE to put out a report at the end of the last fiscal year. And uh, in February, we uh, actually delivered it and uh, reported on it. So that was great. Um, this report is a follow-up in many ways to the 2019 report. And in the 2019 report of strategic plan for U.S. burning plasma research, <clears throat> one of the key recommendations was the U.S. should remain a partner in ITER as the most cost-effective way to gain experience with burning plasma at the scale of a power plant. And uh, Troy touched upon that in his presentation. The second recommendation there was the U.S. should start a national program of accompanying research and technology leading to the construction of a compact pilot plant to produce electricity from fusion at the lowest possible capital cost. Now, this second recommendation would actually was a motivator for the study. And the other motivator for the study was what uh, Troy mentioned, the fact that private industries in the United States is putting in a large amount of resources in developing fusion now. So DOE working with the Academy developed a statement of task that we were to provide guidance on the objective of constructing a pilot plant in the US to produce electricity from fusion at the lowest possible capital cost. And we we'll provide a report that addresses what are the key goals for all the critical aspects of a pilot plant. Uh, one important difference compared with the previous study is it's independent of the climate concept. And that reflects the issue that industry is looking at many, many different climate concepts. Uh, so they wanted the goals for all. Uh, another one was to identify the principal innovations needed from the private sector and government to meet these key goals. Important, they said that we have to seek input from future future owners of power plants, power plants and manufacturers of components. And we have to characterize the energy market for fusion, provide input on in how a fusion power plant can contribute to national energy needs. And the last two actually was quite an important element of our report. I'm going to give you the key takeaways and then show you a couple of slides, a few slides as to how we got there. Our first recommendation was to use the United States to be a leader in fusion to make the impact on the transition to a low carbon emission electrical system by 2050. The Department of Energy and the private sector should produce net electricity uh, from uh, in a fusion power plant in the United States from 2035 to 2040 timescale. The second recommendation we should move forward now to foster the creation of national themes, including public private partnerships that will develop conceptual pilot plant designs and technology roadmaps that will lead to an engineering design that will bring fusion to commercial viability. And our conclusion is to accomplish this successful operation for pilot plant in this time frame requires urgent investment by DOE and private industry, both to resolve the technical and scientific issues to design, construct, and commission a pilot plan. Uh, this is an outline of our report. I'm going to talk about the four bullets on the bottom. Uh, the first one is the role of pilot plant in, in the US marketplace. And one of the things we obtain in the course of this is information what the utilities are doing. And the utilities foresee a transition to low carbon electrical generation by 2050. These are the companies you see on, on the left, on the right hand side of that plot, uh, showing their commitments to making this transition. If anything, the new administration wants a much more rapid transition. The implications of this are actually quite profound. If we go to the generation of low CO2 emission, the average cost of electricity had, could go up. And you can see that on the plot on the right. Uh, if you don't have what's called firm low carbon 
uh, and uh, electrical source, in, in particular things which are dispatchable. You can avoid the cost increase by having firm low carbon uh, electrical source. And this has actually resulted in our first major recommend, finding and recommendation. A pilot plant must provide the technical economic information needed to, for utilities to operate future plants. And it needs that to be able to see what the cost will be in order to obtain these cost savings. It must be attested to ensure public confidence in technology and the success of the commercial plants that will follow. Also, as we've seen so much in the last 20 years, and I'm sure it'll be even true in the next 20, due to the evolving energy marketplace, the characteristics of future power plant will, must be periodically reviewed by energy experts and updated to increase the likelihood that the future concept will successfully contribute to the needs of society. We then looked at what the goals of a fusion pilot plant are. Uh, and the first finding is that it must be based on a vetted and well-established refinement physics basis for achieving that plasma gain in excess of unity. And we talked about three operating phases of the pilot plant. Uh, we we'll begin with the DT and move on to really vet the concept. And then on the basis of that, in the year 2045, you would have the information you need to build a personal time power plant. And I'll talk about these operating phases a bit more. So a pilot plant must produce an amount of fusion power and energy that is sufficiently representative of market needs in order to meet the pilot plant's goals of demonstrating integrated performance and cost while demonstrating net electrical electricity gain greater than one and produce at least 50 megawatts of net electrical power. Another important consideration for a pilot plant is, is economics. On the basis of today's energy market in the United States, the fusion first of a kind power plant will need to have a total overnight construction cost less than $5 billion to $6 billion in order to be viable in the present US electrical marketplace for a projected operating lifetime for at least 40 years. What we concluded is a fusion pilot plant should have a generating power of at least 50 megawatts and a total overnight construction cost less than five to $6 billion. You don't wanna have it cost so much that there's a huge uh, extrapolation in costs going to a commercial plant. We talked about the innovation research needs and to meet the challenge of having a viable design by 2028 and initial operation 2035 to 40, we need innovations in climate concepts and technology to attract fusion power and close the fusion fuel cycle. And these should be developed in parallel. Um, and this will enable the, the engineering design for pilot plant and the construction decisions to be accelerated by a combination of government and private funding. This resulted in our strategy. Uh, we identified what the key uh, gaps were as far as en uh, engineering and research. And these will be addressed in the near term through the so-called conceptual and preliminary design phase. During that phase, we formed these national teams and we're talking two or four teams to develop conceptual design technology roadmap. Uh, we we'll demonstrate physics bases uh, to close the gaps in physics. Very importantly, we have to decrease, uh, increase the technical readiness level of critical technologies. Uh, we have to define the regulatory framework, uh, possible side options, and very importantly, perform the preliminary design. We need the preliminary design to obtain a good cost schedule basis so you know what you're going into as you move towards final design and construction and start of operations. So we hope that we can do this by 2028. And by 2035, the device will be built, commissioned, uh, the, the, and operating in non-nuclear phase. Then you go into this first operating phase to demonstrate sufficient fusion plasma energy gain and the, the, the electricity. In the second operating phase, and this is absolutely critical, you want to operate for long enough periods of time to show that integrated fusion components demonstrate an environmental cycle. So you can operate, replace components, just as you would for a commercial system. Uh, no, not at the full power, it's only 50 megawatts. And on the basis of that, you will take sufficient technical cost information for design, construction, and maintenance for a first of a kind power plant. 
Uh, with that, you can go into a third operating phase to further optimize it to develop other components for advanced technology tests. Uh, but this is our, our overall scheme. So we recognize you know, something like this, which is, as Troy mentioned, more aggressive than uh, the FISAC report. There are risks and opportunities. Uh, the risks are the level of scientific and technical technology readiness resulting in schedule risk uh, has to be acknowledged. Um, and there's another risk that we won't support the electri electricity transition. People will say, well, on this, this time scale, fusion is not needed. It's important to realize that both the United Kingdom and China are working towards being the first to put fusion on the grid. Uh, and of course, there's the risk of obtaining sufficient public and private funding. Uh, there are also opportunities. One is the engagement of the private sector, which we've seen, which I mentioned, which is very, very important. Another one is the impact of transition to a low carbon emission electricity. Uh, society is moving ahead to make this transition. And the question is, can we engage fusion in that transition? And for us to be a leader in development of fusion energy as a country, uh, we feel that the risk we've identified and mitigated by performing research and development in parallel with design, and we have clear decision points to evaluate progress and moving ahead. So with that as a close, I think we've identified in this report the goals, innovations, and a timeline to move forward for fusion to power the grid. Uh, we recognize the plan is bold. Uh, we feel it's achievable. Uh, the United States has historically played a major role in developing the fundamental science for fusion. Uh, the U.S. could take the lead in this technology, or we could let other countries take the lead. And uh, obviously, many of us would like the United States to be a lead in this technology. So thank you for your interest. And I'm going to turn it over now to uh, uh, Brian. Thanks, Rich. So I'm going to build off of what uh, Rich just said. And I want to highlight just a little bit more the aspects of high performance computing. And then I'm going to hand off, I'll be relatively brief and hand off to Dave Humphreys, who's going to tell you about the 2019 report that FES did in, in collaboration with Oscar on machine learning and artificial intelligence. So for us, integrated simulation is a key part, much like uh, Troy and, and Chris talked about in the community plan and, and the FESAC long range plan. So this first bullet here is, is the recommendation that, our, that Rich already noted, that we think we have a, a, it's an ambitious but achievable plan, but we're gonna need to move forward rapidly, both in terms of defining what the fusion power plant confinement concept is and move forward on the technology to extract the fusion power and close the fusion fill cycle. And again, modeling and simulation is going to play an important role there because a lot of these are, excuse me, I just jumped forward instead of back because a lot of these are multi-physics aspects of phenomena. And so we're going to need both the leadership scale computing through SIDAC projects to support high fidelity simulations that can serve the basis what we have limited experimental capability available to benchmark and determine the reduced parameter models, possibly including artificial intelligence. Um, and the more detailed physics models will also play a role with system and process models that can be combined into a full device model, a fairly comprehensive engineering based tool that can contribute to evaluating design operations and maintenance. So with that, and also thinking about the use of engineering computer aided design, structural analysis, and sort of the 3D plant simulators as part of the construction optimization part of the design. I think there's lots of opportunities, both for the leadership scale computing, as well as what uh, Chris called capacity or cap capability computing. Now, again, the significant recommendations there are that there's a number of technology challenges that we have to address simultaneous with the fusion power plant design or the confinement concept. And those challenges are both in terms of the plasma facing components that are mediating the plasma material interactions and extracting the heat, uh, potentially also looking at the possibility of using liquid metals rather than solid components. And that correspondingly, we need to have a significant amount of study and research 
that's there and a number of new facilities, but the new facilities will be complicated, uh, complemented, not complicated, complemented with the sort of uh, high performance computing as well as more capability computing. So among the new facilities that we're gonna need are heat flux testing pro platforms. Uh, Troy already mentioned the prototypic neutron source, linear devices for testing plasma facing components and add to that advances in high temperature superconducting magnets and how the magnets and the shielding materials for the magnets and structural support degrades under neutrons, structural and functional materials, and then blankets. So that is all in our report. I wanna take my National Academies hat off for a moment and give you a little bit of personal perspective since I leave. Sorry, uh, Brian, uh, your, yes. slide, uh, your slides are not advancing. Uh, <sighs> that is- There we go. Stop share. Thanks for letting me know, Debbie. I, yeah. We're all having Zoom fatigue and uh, yeah, some days it works and some days it doesn't. So hopefully you're seeing worse personal perspective on plasma material interaction slide. Yes, um, we are. Thank you. Super, so the, the plot on the, on the right here really highlights the multi-scale, multi-physics aspect of this because there are processes that are occurring in the plasma scrape off layer or the boundary plasma where it's going to interact with the material surface. There are processes going on in the material surface driven by ion implantation and neutrons that are passing through that are modifying properties and microstructure. And then there's processes at the interaction, sputtering gas implantation that are influencing essentially the hydrogen tritium fuel saturation and fuel permeation. And all of these complex processes, whether you think about it as a multi-scale, multi time multi-scale phenomena, or you think about it more sort of cartoon pictorial process are highly coupled to each other. And so what we have done in our SIDAC project is develop a framework for integrating uh, multiple codes together. And so what is shown in the top left here is a sort of schematic of the magnetic field lines and the eater diverter and some trajectories of an uh, ionized, sputtered and ionized particle coming off the surface here of the diverter on the right and some gas species on the left that are implanting. We've developed a framework and, and there's arrows here, and now I went too far, um, showing essentially that we're using background fluid and coupled neutral Monte Carlo frameworks, Sol PS developed in, in Europe to define the boundary conditions of the scrape off layer plasma in terms of the plasma temperature, density, and flow. We're passing that information as we get near the surface to codes that are being extended to make use of GPU processing to model how the sheath is accelerating particles into the surface, causing erosion of tungsten wall atoms or plasma facing components, and then simulating and modeling the impurity transport and evolution as well as passing information into the implantation profiles and simulating the cluster dynamics response of the evolving surface chemistry. These arrows here are shown as if they need to go back up. And what we've demonstrated in our SIDAC is that we can do sort of the one-way flow with a little bit of two-way coupling here. So we model the interior surface of ITER, get the edge plasma conditions from Sol PS, model the sheath, the implantation, and then subsequently the erosion and redeposition and pass information to Shalotl to evolve this. And this is something that we've developed in coordination with other side acts, in particular the Atom side act. So we've developed a framework that's basically a file-based integration of sequentially run codes where we need to go in the future and able to better enable and use these tools to help evaluate designs is we've got to close this loop going all the way back and we need to push for dynamic coupling. So with that, I want to stop talking and not spend too much time and pass it over to Dave Humphreys, who is going to tell you, I think, things that really will be very interesting for this group in terms of uh, the, the advancements in computing and where we see, in particular, machine learning and artificial intelligence going forward. So, Dave. Thanks so much, Brian. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we hear you, Dave. And see my screen? Yes. All right. Can you see my full screen? Yes. Excellent. Let's see if it works better here. <laughs> so I'm going to give you hopefully a brief overview of our research needs workshop um, on advancing fusion with machine learning. 
Um, as Brian mentioned, it was a joint Oscar FES workshop that brought together the two communities in pretty much equal balance, um, as well as participants from the public sector and other areas to identify priority research opportunities um, in the machine learning AI space. And I'm going to use this MLAI, um, and I'll say it that way. So hopefully that will be interpretable. Um, that's the idea was areas in fusion science where MLAI can be transformative and also identify the gaps for applicability to enable that, that application um, and, uh, and, and achieve the, the accelerations possible. And another goal was to identify research principles that would allow us to use ML and AI techniques effectively. Um, so we had about 70 people participating and we broke up into a bunch of panels to address the issues. And the fundamental results were we came up with seven PROs, priority research opportunities, science discovery, diagnostic boosting, model extraction and reduction, control augmentation, what we call extreme data algorithms, um, which isn't obvious. I'll go into more detail about each of these in a moment, um, and data enhanced prediction and uh, a machine learning data platform um, specialized for fusion application, which sort of enables all of these things. We also identified uh, the uh, critical foundational activities and resources, what we called foundational, because you can't do any of this machine learning application without these resources, like experimental facilities that produce the experimental data, um, primarily on which the uh, machine learning approaches depend, but also theory and HPC exascale computing resources to produce simulation data on which machine learning can depend equally. By the way, I'm going to highlight in red throughout this talk things that I think are explicitly of, of interest um, in this NERSC space. Um, and so hopefully those will focus some of the, uh, the relevant observations to, uh, to this meeting. And then finally, connections among domain experts um, in fusion science, computer science, statistical inference, mathematics, and indeed other areas that make this possible. So the first PRO was science discovery, which means approaches to bridging gaps in our theoretical understanding by identifying um, what's missing using data-driven approaches. Um, so we can accelerate hypothesis generation and testing. We can optimize experimental planning to help us fill those gaps in, in a, a, an extremely fast way. And um, we're thinking about things like theory data hybrid models. Um, for confinement and some of our major uh, theory gaps right now. Um, one, one version of this actually is the, the success with NIF in bridging their theoretical predictions using data and improving their, their pulse scenarios. Um, and that's a hybrid um, approach to, to uh, expanding your science. Machine learning boosted diagnostics means application of ML methods to maximize how much information you get out of your measurements. Um, so enhanced interpretability, um, systematic fusion of multiple data sources, and generation of synthetic diagnostics that allow you to amplify your inference. And this is a space, again, for uh, advanced computational resources, even at the leadership scale. Model extraction of reduction is one of those areas that people think of frequently for machine learning, um, constructing models that enhance your understanding fundamentally and kind of confirm that you have what is the core of science, a predictive model um, for highly complex processes. So again, I think uh, the, the key role for computational resources is in accelerating computational algorithms um, with model reduction in multi-scale multi-physics simulations and supporting hierarchies of fidelity in computer codes for whole device modeling. In fact, beyond that, um, in the kinds of, of integrated multi-physics platforms that uh, Brian was talking about, for example. Control augmentation is an area that's really rich um, for machine learning applications, but I think less so for exascale and large scale CPU, GPU hybrid systems. Um, the idea is to you know, create control level models enable your, your real-time analysis of signals um, to be faster, better, and optimizing uh, your overall control designs. Extreme data algorithms is a, a complex field that, um, mul that, that combines multiple processes. For example, in-situ and in-memory analysis 
and reduction at the same time of extreme scale simulation data because you produce massive amounts of, of data that embeds massive amounts of information. And when you're running these things at a high rate, uh, it helps enormously to reduce that data in real time. The same is true for our experiments. Increasingly, and ITER will be a, an extreme example of this, uh, experiments will be producing enormous amounts of stream data. And in order to ingest it, analyze it, and in fact, to federate it around the world in real time, you're gonna have to reduce it at the source and algorithmically is one of the best ways to do it. Um, and so managing the amounts and the speed of data that are generated by codes and experiments um, is something that is of great interest. Prediction is another area that people frequently associate with machine learning. Um, so algorithms that predict key plasma states uh, and indeed system states for a, a functioning experiment and eventually a power reactor are critical. And machine learning can provide um, sometimes the only solutions to these kinds of things. And disruption prediction is one example of where it's been very, very successful um, to date. Another area and the last and perhaps the most important um, in the, the, the sense of enabling all of the above is the Fusion Data Machine Learning Platform. So here we're thinking of a cross-cutting collection of research and implementation activities that develop specialized resources that'll support our ability to apply all of these methods in a scalable way to Fusion. So you've got to create a, a novel system um, for managing, formatting, curating, accessing, marshalling, using the data, both experimental and simulation um, in an optimal way for machine learning. So the foundational resources and activities I've mentioned at a high level, of course, are experiments, both US and international, and the greater your ability to integrate these together in common platforms, the greater your ability to apply powerful machine learning approaches to extract you know, unified information from all of that data. But of course, theory programs and the computational resources that drive them, um, high performance computing, exascale, and uh, in large GPU forms are, are critical. So this is uh, an observation um, that I think is relevant uh, for the Fusion Data Platform of the supporting infrastructure, in addition to the kind of memory data uh, you know, curation, you also need lots of infrastructure to manage that data and to make it useful to, uh, to applying machine learning analysis. So automated metadata extraction is something that uh, is, is woefully lacking in our field. We need to be able to create data labels on a large scale and in an automated way to enable us to apply um, various kinds of supervised learning, for example. Um, and we need federated availability of all of that around our institutions um, and ideally around the world. Um, and that'll again, make our both unsupervised and supervised learning much more powerful uh, at, a, at, a, at a much higher level, in fact, in, in knowledge space. And so tools and workflows for this fusion data platform are critical. And on the right, you see really highlighted all of the pieces I think are relevant for application of NERSC resources. But so getting a little specific, I just pulled out some high level observations on potential NERSC roles. Um, and these are intended to be sort of classes of, of roles. Um, and so um, don't think of, of these specific applications as being limiting. So generation of large scale simulations and other computational data sets is in a sense, the, the core role that we envision you know, for leadership scale uh, computing and indeed more, more uh, machine learning tuned um, systems. So surrogate model training um, will be one thing that's immediately made possible by making these large scale simulation databases and acceleration of simulations and other algorithms that uh, are enabled by that. Uh, but of course, when you have enormous simulation databases, you can couple them with experiments. Um, you in a sense have all of the information embedded in that space that you can then extract in an efficient way. And then I've referred to direct computational resources for machine learning training, for hyperparameter optimization, for supporting the process itself. So Perlmutter, for example, um, you know, in phase one now, 
is, uh, of course, large-scale tensor core GPUs already uh, a resource that is of this type. Um, but also application of heterogeneous HPC architectures um, that'll allow us to process um, all this space of data, experimental simulation metadata. And we shouldn't forget that there's lots of domain data sources that need to be integrated into all of this beyond the usual suspects. Um, you know, so it, things like, you know, ADAS and, uh, and international databases and um, the meta metadata, if you will, that governs all of these things, constraining data on designs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so finally, I alluded to this for the Fusion um, Data Platform, the infrastructure for curation and preparation of the metadata and marshalling your data for an application, the algorithm integrated visualization and data space analysis. So one of the things that people aren't usually thinking of when they think about doing machine learning is you spend a lot of your time, maybe most of your time analyzing the data space itself to prepare for the appropriate kind of, um, of algorithmic uh, solution and an optimized workflow. And you need enormous amounts of infrastructure for that, which we really don't have. People are fond of making their own little things out of Python or MATLAB and, um, you know, and that's kind of how we do it. But we need to make a large scale um, system to support this. So I've told you um, about our, our uh, a research needs workshop, um, which is motivated by, of course, the huge advancements in uh, um, in machine learning these days and the awareness by DOE that there, there's a lot of potential for even more advancements, specifically in fusion. Um, and uh, this workshop, I should mention, was one of many, uh, both grassroots and um, formally driven by the government. In fact, not just at DOE, but in NASA and DOD and commerce everywhere. Um, and so the awareness is, is definitely um, quite keen on the ability of these approaches to, to uh, accelerate our science. And we came up with seven priority research opportunities that we think are um, very um, ripe for application and, and advancement in fusion. So that's what I've got. Thank you very much. Well, I think we, well, yeah, thank you all again. Probably yeah. more slides than you wanted in a short period of time, but I really hope there are some questions, so. I, uh, I see Eli has, has his hands up, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my prerogative and ask one, one first before Eli. Um, and that is, uh, you, you presented a, you know, a, a very, a very clear, you know, vision, which I, I think is great with the data pilot plant and other things. But there's a lot of talk about um, infrastructure that needs to be built that doesn't exist, and I don't, I don't just mean, um, you know, buildings and and facilities, but a lot of it is is organizational and software and this sort of thing. And so I'm wondering, where do you see the biggest challenges? And in particular, from a computing or data analysis standpoint to, to reaching this vision? Probably several of us should try to answer. I actually think the only way we're gonna bridge the gap between where we are now and where we need to be is a combination of experiment theory and computation. Uh, if you just do trial and cut, you know, it's not going to get us to where we need to be. If you just do theory and computation without doing the experimental work, it's not going to give you the confidence that you need. So it's going to be a combination of all of these uh, that's absolutely critical to uh, close the gaps, both in the science side and the technology side. Yeah, I was, you know, there are a lot of things that need to be done, a lot of tasks and things like this. And so you can all, almost imagine um, putting some of this into kind of a DOE project framework with milestones and, and this sort of thing. And I was wondering if there is um, some organizational or, or structure or plan plan to do that and where, where nurse might fit into that kind of a thing. I mean, I can offer a comment. I think in my mind, I mean, we still haven't fully defined the, this design effort, this FPP design effort. And as I mentioned, you, we kind of envision this as a way to guide the efforts in the program. So you could imagine that structure is set up in a way because you have to coordinate the, the computational activities with the experimental activities and probably within that activity is where you do it. How, uh, how, what that's going to look like, I think we need to work on right away to specify it um, as a community. Okay, thanks. Eli, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, so um, uh, 
Chris, you had, um, you talked about a bunch of sort of um, different types of, of modeling that needed to be done, right? Both in terms of, you know, very large scale, high resolution simulations, and also just parameter space searches to narrow things down so that you can be more efficient about the experiment um, uh, part of things. Um, so I guess I, I have kind of a two pronged question about this. Um, one is, uh, is that what is referred to as whole device modeling um, in, in other sort of um, DOE FES language? Or is that an, an expansion or augmentation or a separate effort from that? And then um, uh, related to that, um, how much of that is just, how much of that computing is just straight simulation and how much of that takes much more advantage of the data platform that, um, that Dave Humphreys was talking about? Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so the, the, I mean, I would say like the, the whole device modeling, we have different frameworks, but you know, I, I mean, the analogy we've used sometimes, like if you think about like climate modeling or something, like if I want to do, you know, just the climate model, like I need to couple my models of the atmosphere, the ocean and all these different phenomena going together. So that's what we mean in that sense. And so then, you know, what, what I was saying about like, we talk about like, you know, building these better models, like, okay, we maybe want a better model of cloud formation or atmospheric, you know, transport. And so, you know, one end of that is, you know, we can do super high resolution Navier Stokes kind of things, looking at stuff in super great detail, but then you might extract that down into some sort of subgrid model. And then as we couple that together, depending on what fidelity of that integrated model you, you may use, like you may even build a neural net of that subgrid model, like because depending on how many things. So that's the kind of things that we're, when I, you know, when I talk about like, you know, we've done, you know, having that, that, that kind of coupled range there of, you know, you, depending on what you need and what your applications are, you need to get all those physics down to operating very quickly so that, you know, you're not, your overall like, you know, climate model isn't being held up by needing to resolve a cloud, but you've got 20 other things running. So like, you know, if you have to do that, many, many different things going on, you need all those to be fast. And yet we have to find that right balance of what's efficient versus what's accurate. It doesn't, you know, quick and bad is no better than slow and right. Um, so, you know, in that sense, that's sort of where I, you know, I think, and that, you know, that historically we, we've done a lot of that already on the, uh, the plasma physics side. So sort of like you this picture behind me, like, okay, that's, you get to glow in plasma, but you know, the, the next step I think there is sort of, what do we, you know, we need to understand that better, but what do we do with all the heat that starts impinging on the walls, the stuff Brian was talking about, the, the fluxes, the neutrons, how do they irradiate the materials? How do we build the uh, materials that stand up to that environment? Things like that. So in all, all these kinds of things, um, I talk about could go there. So, I mean, in that sense, I'm not as sure about, you know, uh, maybe Dave might also want to jump in, but I could certainly see in terms of like the data platform and all, like, there's things that we know how to simulate. There's things that we don't, or we don't know how to simulate, or we know the simulations aren't good enough yet, but maybe we have experimental data. And that's places where like, if we have these platforms, you know, we can, you know, we've historically, we've kind of focused either on totally empirical or totally analytic models. And I think, you know, historically at times we've done things that we used to call semi-empirical models where, you know, we have some insight, but, you know, maybe we can have some more calibration from experiments. So I think, that's a whole vast opportunity now where you know we take some of the results from our experiments, you know, use these data tools, the, the data platforms, combine that with what can we get from simulations, what can we get from experiment, and knowing where we need to project to combine that all to build those reduced models that let us get to where we want to be on a timely fashion. Um, and I was just gonna have just one other comment, you know, for Richard, uh, you know, the previous question. Um, you know, this question, you know, came up a lot you, in the CPP, and one of the things we talked about was having things like um, the need for what we called computing. Uh, I mean, we talked about like computing infrastructure, but engineering sports. So we often think about like if we have a large experimental facility, we, you know, you have the scientists, but you also have a whole lot of technicians and people that help you keep you know, all just the systems running. And a lot of the codes, especially these higher performance ones, are now so complicated that. You know, it's not a one man, it's not a one person effort anymore. Um, that you know, if and especially like if you, there's a tension there. If you know, you, you might often have a, a plasma physicist that does that initial coding because they know the physics what they need to put in there. But to make that usable across the community, 
you kind of need more support. So getting sort of like that kind of equivalent support of how do we, you know, um, keep these things portable so you don't have someone that's really focused on physics and using that code is trying to learn, you know, how do I get this onto GPUs? So, so getting all these, those kinds of that equivalent, you know, kind of engineering support and portability and things like that um, is, is definitely a need. And that, that's true, you know, I think across the whole field. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And I know we're we're over already. And so um want to thank you again. And you know, there's 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 a lot of there that a lot um in the presentation there are just more touch points, I think, between what kind of we're thinking about and what you've been thinking about too, which I think is great. And hope we we you know we can continue to work with the community in the future, especially around the, the need for simulation. We don't want to we don't ever want to forget about the the need for the the simulation so it's, it's really it's really nice that you've explicitly pointed that out um but you know we're looking at a lot of things about how we do, do integration with experimental facilities you know the machine learning the ai you know uh, and then of course eli is involved with all the, the es the, the network capabilities that are needed for that um but we're also looking at you know how, what do we need to do to support workflows and we're starting to try to develop some kind of a, a qis strategy and so knowing what you're interested in too is, is really important to us and, um, and i'm sure there's a lot of other things we haven't thought about so you know i think i think we're all thinking along the same lines which is really great to see and um i just uh, hope we can continue to work closely together i don't know anybody else want to make any final comments or questions um, I would just like to say I'd like to learn a lot more about that data program. The the your vision there, I think I think it's I've seen that be transformative for other fields, um, and so I think it's a really good thing to pursue. There's a question in chat from Annette. Yeah. Oh, do you see uh, the data that's... platform more as readily accessible storage for interoperable data, or more as a data store where the elements are all in active use? Yes, yeah, so we're talking about the fusion data platform um, in our vision of the machine learning uh, enabling environment that it's important to we were identifying this as an essential absolutely essential piece to make large scale integrated machine learning possible in the US. I mean, as long as you have balkanized data, you will be limited in your ability to extract what's there right. Um, and and that is. Uh, I think um, very much in active use. The the whole notion of this system is that it's uh, it's for uh, one stop shopping, and of course you can architect this in a distributed way, right? You can have your data stored in different places, but you must be able to get the pipe fast enough, the access clean enough to get data merged in your space through this platform. Um, but the data is always in active use. So you're using the platform to create new data spaces and marshal them on, on that platform and combined theory data, computational data, simulations, experiments, domain data, um, new metadata, and execute those things. Um, and so it is a, a very active, you know, um, full duplex kind of system. Um, and it, it does depend on, you know, Eli's, uh, magic for achieving high throughput data, because one of the big uh, throttles for this kind of activity, if we want to pull in, if, for example, international data from Europe, from China, from Korea, um, is that. Um, and it's, it's the same for real-time engagement when we're trying to stream data between shots as it is for a workflow in machine learning analysis or any scientific analysis, I would argue, actually. Um, so, yeah. Um, we have a key need for machine learning kinds of applications, but it seems clear to me that this would accelerate and enable our entire scientific enterprise by putting all the data together in a place and giving us the tools to access it efficiently for whatever your workflow is. Thanks. Thanks, Annette. Great question. Okay, well, I want to thank you again, and um, this was great. So uh, give you a, a round of applause. And say, have a good day.